Welcome back. We are on day five of the Advent Code 2019 challenge. Which is to say that we're on December 5th. We could see yesterday, here's the puzzle progress that I had made. Uh, solving problems one, two, and three. You can see the website. Uh, it's adventofcode.com to register for that. You will need a login with one of the familiar OAuth authentication pages. You don't have to use a GitHub account like I'm using. You could use like Google or Twitter or something. I don't remember. But if you have an online presence, chances are you can use one of the uh, OAuth services there um, to identify with the site and start solving problems. Uh, to, I think all the problems are open access to anybody but to get access to the second half of a problem, you do need to solve the first half. So, yeah, good evening. Also, uh, thank you. Look forward to seeing you here in the future. Um, so, let's dive into yesterday's problem, which is called Day 4 Secure Container. Oh, I should give the narrative behind the story a little bit. Santa's lost in space. He's been delivering presents around uh, the universe. I don't know if it was the galaxy or beyond, but he needs some measurements from some stars out in space. So he needs us to go collect stars and do some measurements in order for him to be able to find his way back home. So hopefully by Christmas we'll be able to have him find his way back to Earth and get his uh, complete his job. We'll see. Um, I'm optimistic. I don't know why. And I'm attempting to solve these puzzles in the language called Kotlin. It's a language similar to Java, runs on a JVM, it's object oriented. It does uh, quite a bit more uh, syntactically than Java does. I was going to say it does more with functional programming, but that's not necessarily true. Um, it is definitely a more structured... Well, no, that's not true either. It's a language that imposes greater discipline on the programmer, or if you violate the discipline, it's at your own peril. Um, Java... Um, I don't know. Java also, you can use that at your own peril. <laughs> Many people do, um, but the JVM is quite popular. And Kotlin makes it easy, once you know the language, to write complex programs. And that's what we're trying to demonstrate. So day four, secure container. I arrive at the Venus Fuel Depot, only to discover that it's protected by a password. The elves had written the password on a sticky note, but somebody threw it out. However, they remember a few key facts about the password. It is a six-digit number. All right, oh. Uh, so I'm using IntelliJ IDEA. Um, let's see, the value is within the range given in the puzzle input. Uh, value in input range uh, to adjacent identical digits because somebody <laughs> felt lazy typing it in um, mon oh, monotonically increasing um, the digits never decrease they only increase or stay the same other than the range rule uh, the following are true um, oh see so you could check if a password meets these rules. The range rule has to do with the input range. Um, oh, okay, so I don't have to navigate to a different page. Um, here's my range. Um, your range may differ, but that's my range. So 11, 11, 11 meets the criteria. 22, 34, 50 does not because 0 uh, is less than 5. 1, 2, 3, 7, 8, 9 does not have uh, two adjacent identical digits. Um, how many different passwords in the range satisfy the criteria? 
All right. So Kaplan script allows me to, uh, I suppose, I'm not so familiar with this editor, so I'm probably gonna make a ton of typos. Um, valid. So first of all, this input range is a six digit range. Uh, I don't need this rule. Um, I could maybe benefit from it later, we'll see. Uh, n as of type integer. And um, so we're going to check if uh, n, well, let's start really simple here. Um, it's a six digit number. Now those numbers don't contain any identical digits. Uh, if n is less than this, and we'll wander our way into a FP style, or n is greater than that, return false, um, return true down here. Now to actually do a return, well, I do need to uh, specify the return type. It's going to be Boolean. Um, so monotonically increasing digits. You know, maybe I don't want to take this in as an int. I don't know. Um, so we can uh, actually define several functions here. So we define if it's in range, that's one thing. Yeah, let's do that separately. Uh, fun in range n int equals uh, this, except it's the negation of that. Um, so it has to be greater than that value and less than this value. There's uh, one check. All right. Yeah, Kotlin does, uh, and I could actually specify here if I wanted to, that this takes an int and returns a Boolean. And this is how you type in Kotlin. So we got rule number one covered. Two adjacent identical digits. Um, fun adjacent uh, s string. So how do I check this? Um, I forget how to do a regex in Kotlin. If combinatorics, yeah, you definitely would think so. Um, pattern of um, D, uh, wait, there's a way to do this. Uh, zero to nine. No, there's definitely a way to do this. Put this into capture group number one, and then put a back reference in here. Um, so that's the pattern. Um, wait, actually, before I define this function here, let's just try some magic first. Pattern dot match. Actually, I could check if a string matches a pattern. <laughs> it's discouraged, but no, it's doable. Uh, so, like I said, I'm not too familiar with this IDE. I'm going to suffer a bit with it. Matches. Yeah. And then we just put the regex here. Um, and the regex can be in a string form. So we define a capture group. The capture group is a digit 0 to 9. Um, one of those digits and then it's a back reference and what's my problem now is it that this back reference is invalid or something my mouse is misbehaving again I wonder what exactly is wrong with my hardware um, so what's this about required a regex Ew. All right. If 
fine. I guess we'll learn uh, regex Kotlin text. Okay, and then we have to embed the pattern inside the regex. So here we can define the capture group. We can define the range, 0 to 9, end range, back reference 1. Um, yeah. So we'll check. Uh, and to verify that that is actually a back reference and not a literal 1, let's try that. And then let's start executing this and see how far we get. All right. There's our execution. True. 2-2 two, two matches. Um, my mouse died on me yet again. Something about my setup is haunted. Uh, oh, my mouse is back. Um, all right. So fun adjacent um, n colon int is equal to n dot to string. Nope, nope, not what I wanted. Come on. Okay, my cursor died on me again. Um, I don't know, like I got um, this nasty mess of wires here, but there's not a whole lot I can do about it. Also, I don't think, I think it must be the mouse itself. Um, that's discouraging. The keyboard works just fine. It's just the mouse is flickering off and flickering on and flickering off and flickering on. I don't want to move my microphone. Microphone's still working, right? Sound. Yeah, the microphone has no issues. It's just the damn mouse. And I've noticed sometimes that when I click the mouse, that causes um, its LED to illuminate. Let's switch the keyboard to a different USB port. Keep the mouse far away from it. Maybe that'll work better. I've still completely lost my mouse. Um, do I have a backup mouse somewhere? I hope I do. Yeah, regex definitely sounds overkill for the, the task, although you look and you see how quickly I was able to type that up. Um, you never realize how much you depend on things until they're not there. Uh, well, I've got a Steam controller. Could that suffice as a mouse? <laughs> oh god. Uh, heavens no. All right, the mouse is light lit up again. Yay. So to run, that's Control Shift F10. Let's just get used to doing that. Um. Oh. Right. There we go. So being able to see the error was very helpful. Um. So, and I want to define one more function. Um, so we got a pair of adjacent digits. We've got an in-range requirement, which honestly, I probably don't need the in-range requirement if I just iterate through a range, which I'm probably going to do. Uh, but let's start here. And uh, digits are always monotonically increasing. I want to see the regex for that one. <laughs> Actually, it's not. It doesn't sound too spooky. Um, instead of defining the positive regex for each digit must be greater than the one before it, 
another way to do it would be to find a regex that does a negative match. Um, oh man, now I need to do it. <laughs> and combine that into my other regex. Can you imagine doing this all with a regular expression? Because I sure can. And you know that somebody's done it. But yeah, the the challenge would be to look for this regu this expression cannot contain. Um, well, let's try it out. Fun uh, increasing. Uh, yeah. Why don't I do this like like a smart person? String is equal to, and then we put the string in the consumer and not worry about it here. S string boolean equals s dot matches. Um, actually, I could say not uh, matches. Uh, instead, just call this decreasing. How about that? Why not be smart for once? <laughs> All right, um, and this just needs to have uh, either a nine followed by a zero to eight. I typed a nine, didn't I? Or um, an eight followed by a zero to seven, or and so forth. 7 followed by 0 to 6, or 6. Why am I doing a range for the first of these digits? I'm making my life difficult. 9, 0 to 8. Here, let's just start there as an example. Uh, print decreasing of. Um, Let's see, well, let's just say 90 and see if that evaluates true. Control Shift F10 to run. Yep, nice. And is 90 decreasing? 90 is decreasing. Woo! I'm a genius. So 9, 0 to 8, or 8, 0 to 7, or 7, 0 to 6. Um, or six zero to five and this is not like super extensible but um, arguably you could produce you could have a, something that produces the grammar for this um, which might be a better solution uh, three zero to two or two zero to one or ten all right so that should, um, that's one hell of a pattern. And then we say fun f and int is equal to, actually, well, let's, yeah, let's keep this simple. fs string uh, colon boolean is equal to adjacent s and not decreasing s. Print f of. So we have each of our puzzle input examples, 11, 11, 11. Two more examples there. Um, two, two, three, four, five, zero. And we got one, two, three, seven, eight, nine. And I know that's not the problem we were asked to solve, but um, yeah, technically the opposite of increasing is not decreasing. That is true. Uh, and I was incorrect to use the word increasing here. The specification states that the digits never decrease. So uh, I first called this monotonically increasing, um, but uh, 
not decreasing uh, is how it was actually specified. Um, false, false, false. Also, false, false, false. Uh, pretty great. Maybe I print each of these on a separate line. Because um, this isn't false, false, false. Right? Oh, I'm sorry. 11, 11, 11 uh, is not within the range. Okay. So, yeah, these, uh, none of these satisfy the requirements. Well, no, what this is just checking is adjacent and not decreasing. Um, uh, S.find, baby? No. All right. What are all my regex things? Ay, ay, ay. I mean, another way to do this would be put a dot star here and a dot star there, here a star, there a star, everywhere a dot star. Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. Just meaning finding this uh, repeated digits anywhere in the string. So 11, 11, 11 does satisfy 22, 34, 50. Um, does have a pair of decreasing digits. So this has, oh, right, this is subject to the same issue. Dot star here and a dot star there. Here a star, there a star, everywhere a dot star. Um, run. True, true, false. Um, so, uh, no, number two there. This 223450 does not satisfy both of these conditions. It does satisfy the adjacent requirement. Um, but uh, it does not satisfy the non-decreasing requirement. Monotonically non-decreasing? Oh! You are correct, yes. Um, here, let's save myself a little bit of pain and call it what it is. Um, that probably doesn't help any. Yeah, it really doesn't help. Um, I'll leave it back the way it was. So, something wrong with my regex. I'm going to try regex 101 over here. I'm curious, like, uh, obviously this is way overkill, but that's, well, oh, come on. Dot star, dot star, and if I put a 9, 0 to 8 uh, in here, or and eight. Oh, do these all need to be alternating within some sort of container? Let's find out. 90. 90 is a match. 900. Yeah, no, I think the stars I put in there are fine. Um, so there's something I'm missing about how regex works. Wood, carrot, um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, with all the stars in there. Pipe, uh, that work. I'm not sure. I want to say no. I mean, one idea could be just run a series of patterns here, which would be kind of not what I'm aiming to do. Um, I'm just curious, like, dot star means match any series of characters. I shouldn't need to put a capture group around any of this, but if I do, um, that might help. Although I'd really not expect it to. So, like, the alternation there should have worked, in my opinion. There's something subtle about a Kotlin regex, I guess, where I said take any one of these atoms separated by the... Oh, 
I guess this dot star didn't get applied um, the way I expected it to be. Okay, that must be it. Huh. Well, you learn something each day. Yes. Yeah, that's... And that's why I kind of like... I'd hoped that there were a way to call an operation other than matches. Um, <laughs> regex from literal. That sounds scary. Um, there's not an alternate to this, which, like here, matches has to match the entire string. Uh, cont oh, contains. That's better. So let's try that on something simpler here. So does this contain a regex? So this contain consecutive digits that are identical. Because really that's what I was trying to test. And if that works, then we're going to try contains um, on the bottom one as well. So does this uh, contain a match? In Java, you can only use contains for character sequences. Um, Apparently in Kotlin you can use it for regexes, so that's special. Beautiful. All right, so the question set forward to us is looking in this range. Um, so I'm just going to grab this range again. Actually, you can grab it right here if I can copy and paste. Um, Let's start with smaller numbers first. 11 to 99. <sighs> I don't know how this works. <laughs> Guide me. Int range. Invoke is not found. Uh, for each? Is this how to do it? Or is it for capital each? I don't know. Um, for each n, I guess? No. I define uh, n in here. Like that or something. I don't know. Cannot infer a type. Okay. Here, let's try for each 1 to 9. Print a thing. Does this get executed? Do I know Kotlin well enough to... Nope. Nope. Okay, what did I do wrong? <sighs> Replace infix call with ordinary call. Oh, 1.9 dot for each. All right, let's try this maybe. Is this valid Kotlin? Unresolved. Ref... Okay, damn it. Yeah, it won't affect this answer. I'd have to consult a reference. Um, and by that, I mean I'm not going to look at that right now, because really what I'm curious about is can I get the damn thing working. <laughs> uh, Kotlin range for each. For loop. Whatever. Kotlin ranges and progressions at kotlinlang.org. Um, oh. Oh. All right, so here's the way to do it, or here's a way to do it. Four, one through nine. Um, and you can define your scope. Uh, four, n, in. There we go. That's a valid syntax. You can also use x down to y. Um, I assume it's inclusive, but... I don't actually see anything in the documentation explaining that. Um, oh no, the documentation line one there, it's first code example. If i is in one double dot four, is equivalent to checking if i is between one and four. So um, yeah, another way I could have written this would be if uh, n is in this dot dot that 
And also, by the way, the uh, you don't need to be explicit about your uh, return types. So this is even more concise way to write uh, that. So does this program execute? Well, we got some kind of error message or warning or something. True, true, false. And then we got, oh, right. Uh, I was dumb. Now I can be less dumb. There we go. Yeah, let's just print it. What's your suggestion already? Add braces to for statement. <sighs> no, we're just going to run it. You can't make me add braces. I'm not wearing braces. All right, there we go. So instead of those numbers, let's try these numbers. No, just kidding. Let's save that for later. Um, we're going to say if f of uh, and uh, to string. Um, yeah, whatever. Uh, I guess at this point we'll add braces. Fine. Wait, what's your... Are you just struggling? Expecting a condition. Yeah, I would expect a condition there too. That definitely looks like... Oh, okay, you want actual parentheses with your parentheses. I see how it is. Fine. Whatever, we can do that. Um, so to make this work a little bit better, we'll say if for I in 11 through 19. Um, and see, do we get 11 back? Probably not, uh, just knowing my luck. Oh, there's 11, beautiful. Um, so uh, we passed all our unit tests. I hate to blow them away, but we need to make room for um, I mean, I don't have to get rid of them. They were good. They served us well. Is there not a more concise way that I can do this? Probably. Whatever. We'll figure it out when we get there. Um, val variable i is equal to zero. And here we're going to say i plus equals 1. Even though, really, we can count. Actually, yeah. We're going to look at how we aggregate a count across a range. Uh, Kotlin range count. Nope. How about range Kotlin match count? I don't know. There's got to be some way to do this. Any kind of collection, any kind of array has a count method. Um, so instead of doing that silly, silly thing that I was about to embark upon, um, instead of doing a for loop, can here we've got an int range. Can we count? Yes. And this just needs a predicate. Oh, this is good. Um, N. All right, and we just need F and uh, two string. Bam. Print ln of uh, this thing. Okay, I guess this does need parentheses around that thing. But there we go. So instead of saying for 11 to 19, we're just going to print the count of the number of matches in this range that satisfy those requirements. And the answer to that is 1. So instead of running tons of... Yeah, gosh, my mind is mostly melted, but it's still there enough that we don't have to write tons of code and then explain it all. All right. So our answer is just that number. Um, yeah, our tests served as well, but they are no longer required. 
There you go. Um, I mean, I could inline function f here, but well, what you gonna do? This shows a nice composition of functions. So our answer, I'd intended to drum roll there and then my hand fell off the desk. But it's the tiniest drum roll for this tiny little answer. We are one gold star closer to rescuing Santa. Why did Santa go like delivering presents all the way out in space anyway? All right, uh, an elf just remembered one more important detail. The two adjacent matching digits are not part of a larger group of matching digits. <laughs> uh, okay. So, given the additional criterion, but still ignoring the range rule, these do satisfy. So 11, 22, 33 works. 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 4 no longer matches because there's a larger group of 4s. Quadruple 1122 does satisfy the criteria because it contains 22, even though it contains four ones in a row. Okay. There's got to be some fancy way to do that. Um, I am thinking this first regex is... Take any digit and not with a back reference, um, but that this digit exists exactly twice in a row. And I think the syntax for that is this. Or maybe it's the plus and then the two. We're going to try this on regex 101. But uh, I'm pretty sure I got something here. All right, so 0 to 9 plus. If I type in 0, 0, 0, um, all right, and now if I put in the 2 in the middle with the greedy plus operator, it finds the match. So that string is found, but I think I want to find with a negative forward lookup. I don't know. There is a way to make this work with just regexes, and we're going to solve it, damn it. We're going to... I'm just reminded of C. Montgomery Burns and his uh, spirited attitude towards solving a problem. Uh, C. Montgomery Burns had quite a philosophical thing to say. Um, all right. So, wait, two comma would be finding anything of length at least two. So yeah, to find things of two or greater length, this would find those matches. Um, but I want that, I don't want to have to specify like that the thing that got found is of length two even though there's probably a way to do that. Ooh, there's meta sequences um, in regex 101. Oh, those aren't like find the length of the thing. Damn. Um, okay, do we cheat? Do we look this up on the Google? Ask like what's the regex to find? a thing of exactly this length and no longer. Yeah, this is not correct because it will include matches that are longer than two. Um, I want a way of... I mean, I could take the S and then replace... No, that wouldn't work. Um, so the contains just returns a boolean, yeah. So um, I bet Google's seen an increase in search traffic for matches of exact length. <laughs> uh, uh, 
Da, da, da. Using regular expressions to check string length. Beautiful. And ridiculous. Um, length range. Minimum length. Hmm. Oh, wait. Can I do... How do I do, like, a greedy operator with a maximum length? I still thought that, like, the two and with the plus at the end would have sufficed. Hmm. <laughs> oh, wait. Global multi-line. I don't know. I still feel like... Let's... Let's at least try this on our examples. And our examples earlier, let's try it on this example. And we still have a range there. I want to know the count of matches for this. This should be zero, and it's going to be a one. I'm going to be so disappointed. So the goal is to get that to match a zero. Um, So maybe I do go back to using the capture group. Because um, I'm missing something. Regex match greedy. Yeah, standard quantifiers. Oh, there's a possessive qualifier. What's the difference between the possessive and the greedy qualifier again? Um, a plus it applies to the A. W star. Yeah, how do I like? Is it like plus plus? No, that's not valid. Docile, give back when needed. Lazy, as few as possible. Helpful, expand when needed. Possessive, do not give up characters. Now we're talking. A plus plus is possessive. It matches as many characters as needed and never gives them back. So, um, yeah, this is what I'm looking for, but I don't think Java syntax supports this kind of um, possessive qualifier on a regex, which is unfortunate. Um, so there's A plus. Oh, A plus. One or more A's, as many as possible, giving up characters if backtracking is necessary. A plus question mark. Um, as few as needed to match. A plus plus would be one or more A's, as many as possible, but also possessive. And I don't know if Kotlin regexes can have possessive uh, forms. <laughs> Regex, Kotlin programming language. Well, already the top Google results are not encouraging about okay so no you can define a regex with a pattern and you can take regex options and so a regex option hopefully includes possessive but I'm not so sure multi-line literal unix lines comments dot matches all can equality uh, extension functions coerce at least coerce immerse most range to comments down yeah so i don't see possessive mentioned and i don't remember seeing a way to do possessive regexes in java um, so how do i use a quantifier in a regex somebody asks on code java um yeah <laughs> so yeah i don't think i think this is going to be a matter of me just having to define the pattern and iterate through the matches yeah i could do the anti-match which would involve um instead of what i tried to do here we reintroduce the back reference um and then 
have to uh, we have to put the capture group in here and prior to that we have to say um, anything but the back reference so negate back reference one no that's not it I guess we have to do something special there what about anti-matching zero to nine um, back reference one yeah oh well there's a thought yeah so we could do like forward look ahead and see like if we can negate the forward look ahead or have a, a negative forward look ahead I think let's see reg x look around I don't remember how this works possessive and negative look ahead right so look ahead I think would be at the end of this put a question mark exclamation point back reference one there so I think that's a look ahead and then there's a look behind I could stick in front I think that would do it so say find a match where um, the capture group exists exactly twice um, in fact there's still no need to use the back reference notation here um, you can just use a two there instead so you have two consecutive identical digits um, and we're neither preceded nor followed by the captured character I think that would do it yeah Let's see, does this work? Probably not. Does this crash? Well, it neither works nor crashes. I gotta admit, I'm more than a bit disappointed that it didn't crash. Um, sorry. Yeah, let's uh, optimize imports. All right, well, that's discouraging. The problem is that the input can contain that, but also contain an illegal string. Oh. Wait. Is that a problem? If I try this in regex101 again. So, let's see. What's our number? 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 4. And I want to try capture of 0 to 9 appearing exactly twice with a negative look ahead uh, and a negative look behind and have regex 101 tell me what I did wrong full match one two. Oh, I'm sorry this is dumb course I need the back reference um, okay this works in regex 101 does it work in Java and Kotlin I hope so nope <laughs> why does this work in regex 101 but not work in Kotlin do regex does not support all this super awesome stuff I mean, we got the nice, like, red and yellow and green Christmassy colors. Oh, an unresolved back reference. <laughs> that could be an issue. Hmm. It works in... Okay. I'm disappointed. Uh, it works, though. We came up with a solution. It, if you try that in regex 101 that's a forward reference um, I suppose I'll have to look for how to do a forward reference like if I put question mark equals that would be a match um, I think it's probably easier a positive and negative look behind look behind has the same effect but works backwards 
um, tells the regex engine, to, regex engine to temporarily step backwards in the string to check if the text behind can be matched there. Question mark less than um, exclamation point. Um, All right, is this still an unresolved back reference? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does this, what I typed there, work in regex 101? If I put like, wait, what is this called here? Yeah, that's called a negative look ahead in regex 101. Um, and if I stick the less than in there, it's still recognized as a negative look behind. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, that's not a, yeah, no, regex 101 has a problem with this as well. Um, so yeah, this is definitely an unresolved back reference. And I'm not sure the, what the best way to handle that is. Um, So this question mark less than exclamation point A, end parenthesis B, matches a B that's not preceded by an A using a negative look behind. Doesn't match cab, but matches the B in bed or debt. Um, so how do I do a look behind with a reference? Can that be done? <laughs> Java 13 allows you to use the star and plus inside look behind as well as curly braces without an upper limit. Ay ay ay. Look around is atomic. Um, since the condition satisfied, the engine forgets about everything inside the look around. It will not backtrack inside the look around to try different permutations. Yeah, so. I don't think that I can use a reference in a look behind. Um, well, we'll see if there's a way I can find. Um, yeah, no, there's no such thing as a a back reference in a look behind, right? Pregex with negative look behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, this isn't a context free grammar or something. Why does this back reference not work in a look behind? Thanks, Stack Overflow. The short version look behinds are matched right to left. This means the reg extension uh, always encounters the one if it hasn't captured anything in the group yet, so the regex always fails. The solution is quite simple. Oh, okay. Yes, that's an unresolved back reference because in the look behind, um, within that scope, yeah, that's interesting. Um, now this still doesn't work for other reasons. Um, but in <laughs> group reference is not allowed in a look behind in Java and Kotlin. So I think that's the issue. So probably um, even though there's got to be some way to do this, um, we're going to stick to something a bit simpler. So we are going to find a match uh, of at least two. Actually, uh, we're going to find For any character, do a possessive match. And we're going to check um, of those matches, how many of those matches are exactly two digits. 
which is going to require me to use something other than s.contains. Um, regex uh, r is equal to regex of this pattern that we've already defined, which is parenthesis bracket and bracket and parenthesis greedy. Uh, whoops, we don't call it regex. We, we define it here. And then here we go look and see r.match. Oh, we got matches and match entire and contain match in. Um, none of those are what we're looking for. Um, we could split or replace and do ridiculous things. A replace would actually work quite nicely for what we're trying to do. Um, but find all returns a sequence of match results, which this is the strategy I was trying to advocate for. Um, so we find all the matches and we check if any have a given property uh, that for m and wait ay 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 any of these matches you don't use parentheses there use the scope um m dot how do I get the how do I extract the value from um, a match result? I think it's just a value. And if we find any of length two, that satisfies the requirement. So we're going to check. Um, does this contain any matches of length exactly two? So one, two, three, four, four, four does not. One, two, three, four, four, five should contain a match of length exactly two. Come on. Nope. <laughs> I'm disappointed. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, let's try that. Um, yeah, we want to match that character so many times in a row. So we're saying, yeah, find this, um, find a digit that exists at least twice in a row, but possibly more times. Um, as opposed to just find a string of six digits. Yeah, there we go. And was this exactly what you'd suggested earlier? Pretty much. Um, but I found it, so yay me. Uh, so I don't need to define val r. Um, Ew, I kind of prefer that the way I had it. All right. Um, so, um, we're going to add another function in here and then end up with more readable code when we're done. Uh, is length to s string is equal to uh, s dot length is equal to two. Um, except we don't want this. We want uh, <laughs> we've got a regex defined as r. We're going to define our this is a match result. Hopefully, I got the correct match result. Um, and then we're going to say any, uh, come on, is length 2. Are you kidding me? 
Um, I guess method references aren't a thing in the way I thought they were. All right, whatever. There's got to be some way to use a method reference uh, in this composition. I'm just too dumb to figure it out right now. This is legible enough for our purposes for a demo. Um, I'm not sure this is going to work. So we tried this on one, two, three, four, four, four. And we found that there were zero matches there. And then if I also include one, two, three, four, four, five, uh, and eh, for the heck of it, let's try the previous number, four, four, three. We are going to count one match. Uh, the 445 counts. And if I increment this to 449, we're going to find five matches. So I have reason to believe that this is uh, successful. Uh, we could try this on the other inputs. Um, so it's probably not a bad idea. So let's try that on this range, 11, 22, 33, 1, all right. Actually, here's how we should do this. So this no longer meets the criteria because it has three consecutive digits. Uh, a quadruple 11, 22. Uh, does satisfy. So we'll keep those. Um, one, zero, and one. So this matches our tests. Um, and then we'll add the one last test in here. Um, so our input range is this to that and count the number of uh, matches. I'm curious if it, yeah, OK, it did print out the first three numbers first, and then the last one. That's the correct answer. We are one gold star closer to rescuing Santa. Yeah. Let's go back to our advent calendar and celebrate with a new problem. Sunny with a chance of asteroids. That's not lifted from a book title at all. <laughs> all right, cloudy with a chance of meatballs, perhaps. Here's okay. Let me. I'm gonna toggle. There we go. You're starting to sweat as the ship makes its way toward Mercury. The elves suggest that you get the air conditioner working by upgrading your ship computer to support the Thermal Environment Supervision Terminal, the TEST. <laughs> the Thermal Environment Supervision Terminal starts by running a diagnostic program. The diagnostic program will run on your existing int code computer after a few modifications. OK, you want the int code computer back. I guess I should pull that out of my history. So where'd it go? <laughs> I didn't think I was going to need that today. Um, all right, so we got problem one, two, and three. Uh, I think two was the encode computer. Yeah. I don't know how to import this computer, so we're just going to copy it. Sorry. If you thought you were going to see some super advanced Kotlin module stuff today, you were wrong. So our int code computer still runs, yeah? Hopefully. We'll find out in a second. First, you'll need to add two new... <clears throat> um, excuse me? That's not the one I ran. It's not the one I intended to run. <laughs> Let's try problem five. First, you'll need to add two new instructions. Opcode three takes a single integer as input and saves it to the position given by its only parameter. For example, 
the instruction 3 comma 50 would take an input value and store it at address 50. Okay, an input value. Which input value would it take? Um, I guess it would take uh, the value 50 and store it at address 50. Opcode 4 outputs the value of its only parameter. For example, instruction 4 comma 50 would output the value at address 50. Now what do we mean by input? I would like to know. Programs that use these instructions will come with documentation that explains what should be connected to the input and output. The program, this number, outputs whether it gets as input, whether whether it gets as input then halts. Um, interesting. Oh, whatever it gets. Um, so three zero four zero ninety nine. We'll do opcode three. Put that in position zero. Put the input in position zero. Opcode four. Output the contents of position zero, which is no longer a three unless the input was a three. And then ninety nine halts the program. Second, you'll need to add support for parameter modes. Each parameter of an instruction is handled based on its parameter mode. Right now, your ship computer already understands mode 0, position mode, which causes the parameter to be interpreted as a position. If the parameter is 50, it will be stored at address 50 in memory. Until now, all parameters have been in position mode. Now, your ship computer will also need to handle parameters in mode 1, immediate mode. In immediate mode, a parameter is interpreted as a value. If the parameter is 50, its value is simply 50. Um, okay, parameter modes are stored in the same value as the instructions opcode. Um, the opcode is a two digit number based only on the ones and tens digit of the value. That is, the opcode with the rightmost two digits of the first value in an instruction. Parameter modes are single digits, one per parameter read right to left from the opcode. The first parameters mode is in the hundreds digit. The second parameters mode is in the thousands digit. The third parameters mode is in the ten thousands digit, and so on. Any missing modes are zero. Okay. Um. That's ugly. Uh, for example, consider a program 1002, 4, 3, 4, 33. The first instruction, 1002, uh, etc., is a multi multiply instruction. The rightmost two digits of the first value, 0, 2, indicate an opcode of 2, which is multiplication. Then, going right to left, the parameter modes are 0, 1, and 0. <laughs> this instruction multiplies its first two parameters. The yeah, no, it's a multiply instruction. I get that. Uh, its value is in the address stored at four. Uh, wait, no, the first value is in position mode. Oh, I see what it means. A B C D E. So. Now the first parameter is in position mode, as it was earlier. The second parameter, 3, is in immediate mode, which simply has a value of 3 and doesn't read at position 3. The result of the operation, 33 times 3 is equal to 99, is written according to the third parameter. Um, so it's based on position mode again, which also works like it did before. Parameters that an instruction writes to will never be in immediate mode. Uh, why not? Let me think about that. There's probably a reason. Hang on. 
so uh, you could write to a position. Yeah, no, writing in immediate mode would be kind of ridiculous, wouldn't it? You would never write based on... Well, I don't know what that would be based on. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a lot to stuff into day five. Finally, some notes. It is important to remember that the instruction pointer should increase. Yeah, and I remember that by the values, uh, the number of values in the instruction. So for opcodes, um, because of the new instruction, this amount is no longer always four, because now we're able to uh, do these two new operations, which take a single parameter to input or to output, to read or to write. Um, so these only have two, um, there's the opcode and then there's a single parameter. So you would only advance the program counter two instead of four there. Which by itself is probably enough to trip up a lot of people doing this stuff. Um, integers can be negative. So, yeah, I think my program, my computer already accounted for that, but that's good to alert people to. The test diagnostic program will start by requesting from the user the ID of the system to test by running an input instruction. Provide it one, the ID for the ship's AC unit. Uh, it will then perform a series of diagnostic tests confirming that various parts of the encode computer like parameter modes function correctly for each test it will run an output instruction indicating how far the result of that test was from the expected value where zero means the test was successful non-zero outputs mean that a function is not working correctly check the instructions that were run before the output instruction to see which one failed finally the program will output a diagnostic code and immediately halt this final output is not an error. An output followed immediately by a halt means that the program finished. If all outputs were zero except the diagnostic code, the program ran successfully. <laughs> After providing one to the only input instruction and passing all the tests, what diagnostic code does the program produce? Okay. Well, simple question, right? <laughs> a lot of parts to it, but yeah, just well, we're going to type in a random number here. And, no. Okay, we're actually going to try to solve it. Um, so step here, uh, the way I'd previously written it, uh, took three values. Um, so already this is problematic step is not a good word for this anymore op4 is a better name um, so op4 op4 so that's a uh, four well okay yeah no step is fine i don't know we'll come up with a better name for it soon but yeah, this relied on the input being um, here, give us two inputs and we're gonna produce an output. And while that, I guess is still the case for the add and subtract uh, operations, uh, I'm sorry, add and multiply, um, it does not apply to the new functions that we're introducing. Um, uh, so, <laughs> uh, I did, um, yeah, my opcode is still going to define if I'm adding or multiplying. That's definitely still there. Um, but we're no longer always reading from memory, or rather, we're reading, yeah, no, sometimes we're reading in immediate mode instead of reading the value that's in memory. 
So instead of saying memory this and memory this and memory this, um, I how is this all reading again? So immediate mode does immediate mode just take the the value of the parameter itself instead of doing this uh, lookup thing? I think so. It's in position mode, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Wait, so here I previously took. Uh, here's the position. Um, never really defined all these mo parameter modes, and there's one parameter mode for each parameter. So, ah, yeah. In some way, it would behoove me to produce a thing, a class called a parameter, um, and then have that parameter be capable of handling its lookup. And I don't really like that. Um, it's, I don't know. It just feels like that's uh, doing this in a functional programming style seems challenging. Like, yes, I found here's the array index. And then based on the array index, we're going to do a lookup to figure out what position to look up in memory. Um, and all of that gets short-circuited. This double array lookup is short-circuited if we're in immediate mode. So... Yeah, I thought that separating this array lookup from this array lookup would have saved me something, and now I'm finding that this double lookup is um, separating that into two separate steps doesn't help in any way, because immediate mode just takes the parameter. Now, there could be a third mode, which would be, instead of doing this double lookup, just do a single lookup and skip this one. Uh, that mode doesn't exist yet. Although I'm sure it will in the future. Um, yes, yeah, so in the medium mode, a parameter is interpreted as the value. So, um, yeah, let's view. Class value? Okay, what's your beef with me right now? I don't need to uppercase my class names, right? Um, and this will take both. Well, no, this will just take an int. Um, uh, okay. Now, creating this class value is not helping in any way. I was going to say that if this had access to the list inside itself, already I'm violating like um, the law of Demeter by giving the class access to the list. That's not desirable. Um, so here we have our memory. We have position. We have our operation, and I think the operation's fine, it's just where I'm going to do the lookups and where I'm going to do the writes, that's going to be a bit different. Um, so I should define a function to read and a function to write. <laughs> uh, so read, um, and this needs a position. And beyond needing a position, do we need anything? I. Why am I doing this? I've just defined get for an array. Um, no, the reason I'm doing this is because I'm going to introduce an opcode, which is either get the value out of the array or get the value itself. 
Otherwise, this is just ridiculous. But, um... All right, so what do they call... Oh, I'm sorry, it's not an opcode, it's a mode. All right, so our mode, we're going to call it a Boolean now. Um, and we don't need anything special. Uh, equals if mode one thing, else something else. All right. And then we need to define what these uh, things are. So if we are in immediate mode, um, we're going to just return the POS. Otherwise, we're going to return memory POS. Um, and we're going to define a function right. Um, so. Well, we don't need to define a function right now, do we? Um, we're always going to be writing in immediate mode. So there's no need to even parse uh, whether uh, we're writing. We have parameters and instruction that writes. That is, every instruction other than the read instruction. Um, uh, which the parameters for that, uh, parameters for the right operation itself, will never be in immediate mode. So uh, I'm still a bit flummoxed with the parsing of how I'm going to handle um, this, but we'll figure it out. Um, so we are going. I could try to split this before passing it in, um, but that's not going to help. So let's just pass in the instruction with all of its digits. Um, wait, why does this even mention that there are five digits? So there's three parameters. The These two digits represent, oh, we're going to add the values at these two indices together. Um, oh, this makes my head hurt. But basically, uh, this A is never going to be set. Um, here it's omitted doing, due to being a leading zero, but this is always not going to be set in the 10,000s place. Um, even for add or multiply instructions because uh, we are just reassured that parameters that instruction writes to will never be in immediate mode. So this memory at index 3 is always going to be memory at index 3. Um, it's only here where we're reading from memory idx1 and memory idx2 um, that we'd need to do anything. Um, now this double lookup, um, <laughs> here let's replace this, read at this false, and do I have that backward? I'm missing a parameter, uh, memory memory idx1 false, and then memory idx2 false. Um, and that's ugly as heck. So instead of separating it that way, um, and that's not effective either. That's the problem. Yeah, like I said, I've confused myself here. So one option is to take the value at memory index. Well, no, memory position plus one is a value idx, which I've called this index, but now it's more than just an index. This, uh, we'll use this to redo.
All right, so yeah, this is what we wanted. And um, IDX1 is a terrible name. IDX2 is a terrible name now. Um, however, yeah, this is the value that we read out of memory. Oh, but I'm wanting to take not these. I'm wanting to take POS. That's the issue. So let's let's move the double lookup out here. Memory at memory at POS. And now this is just going to be POS plus one. And this is going to be POS plus two. And here we're always writing to there. Um, so I'm confused still. Uh -huh. Zero is equal to position mode for the third parameter. Um, this is written according to the third parameter, four in position mode which works like it did before, and that 99 is written to address 4. I somehow don't think that's what I had before. And yet, my computer did work. So, what gives? Um, all right, also we're going to call this IDX. Even though it really isn't an index, it's not a position either. Um, the one thing that this is repeatedly called is a parameter. So we are going to cave into pressure and just call it P. Um, uh, and then they call this the program counter, so we're going to call it the program counter. And okay, yeah, no, you're right. We do have to read. Um, now, there's no point in me doing it this way anymore. Oh, wait a second. No, I got this wrong again. Um, yeah. No, we do want to read the values out of memory. Let's undo all the stuff that I just confused. Yeah, this double lookup is just me having bad memories. This is what we want. We want to read these values out of memory and then optionally do lookups or just to use the values. Um, so we are going to call this P for parameter. Uh, we are going to, can I rename here somehow? Refactor, rename. Uh, we're going to, instead of calling that POS, just call it PC. Um, what's our keyboard macro for rename? Shift F6. I like that one. That's a lot better than the Eclipse one. Uh, Shift F6. P1. Shift F6. P2. Shift F6. P3. <sighs> Naming is hard. Uh, so, okay. P1. P2. And write operates as it always had. Um, we are going to need a write opcode, so I'm just going to make a write function, even though it's stupidly trivial. Um, do still need an address at which to perform the write. Wow, creating a write function just made this code way more difficult. That's crazy. 
Wow. Just how did I make that more difficult? I don't need a write function. I know how to write. OK. So we have here, if opcode is 1, do the thing. Else if opcode is 2, do the thing. Um, and we're going to do that each way. Else if opcode is equal to 3, do the thing. And we haven't defined the thing yet. Um, so we're going to read and assume we're not in immediate mode. Um, and I'm not sure where we're reading to. Um, so we're as an output instruction, right? What are two new codes? Is three read and four write, or vice versa? It saves it to the position given by its only parameter. So three takes something from input and writes it. Um, so memory at, uh, hang on, let's comment that out. Let's rename this to program counter and memory at PC plus one is equal to PC, except that's probably not true. Uh, it takes a single integer as input and saves it to the position given by its only parameter. Yeah. So 3 comma 50 would take an input value and store it at address 50. Um, now the input value taken by that <laughs> so writing will never be in immediate mode. So I don't need to worry about doing anything tricky for instruction three here, or opcode three. But um, I am confused. I want to see an example of the read or the write operation. Again, 33 times 3 is 99. So we're in the, da, 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 da. the test will do this. OK, yeah, I don't care about the second half of this. I just care, can I implement write? Um, the first instruction is multiply. Uh, that's not helpful either. Um, if the parameter is 50, its value is simply 50. And yet we're told that um, parameters that instruction writes to will never be in immediate mode. So... The parameter, I'm sorry, the address PC plus one is based on some input, and that input might be, I don't know. Opcode four does a read, and that's great, but something's still not quite there. So I'm not seeing a write instruction example here anywhere. So am I having to figure out what write does? Uh, da -da, finally, we'll output a diagnostic code immediately, halt, etc., etc. All right, well, we'll figure that out in a bit. So we've got opcode 3, we're going to have opcode 4, which does a thing somehow. We'll leave that be for a minute. 
Or maybe do we, maybe we start here? All right. Um, read memory, and then we need an a mo or a p pc plus one. So that's the address, and we're gonna assume we're not in immediate mode. Yeah, that's probably a wrong assumption. And that read will run an output instruction. I'm still confused. So we're going to try implementing the output instruction. So output, output for output's value of its only parameter, 4, 50 would output the value at address. Oh, I'm sorry. We did, we did get information about what the input was. The input for our program, uh, after providing one to the only input instruction uh, and passing all the tests, so we're going to say our input is one. What diagnostic code does the program produce? Uh, so that's what's meant by input. Is It's just a constant of one. And um, I guess output literally means dump this to standard out. Uh, so I guess that's what's meant by input and output. Because I'm not seeing a place to store the value of an output instruction. It has a solitary parameter. Uh, would output the value at address 50. Now there is going to be, <laughs> oh, Carl is up to his good old um, Mario Maker stuff. He likes his stream titles, like a troll new world. Well done. Uh, so this, this is a two argument instruction um, to know whether or not uh, this solitary instruction is in immediate mode or if it's not in immediate mode. Um, PC my op divide by 10. Um, or I could say, I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry, this is, I've missed something entirely here. Hang on. Um, I missed something much earlier here. Op is equal to memory of PC, but no, that's not true. I was quite proud. But yeah, memory, here we've got a list of ints. Um, yeah, that's not the op code. The op code is that mod 100. Um, and then the... Why am I even calling that a var? It's not like that changes during any iteration. Var val mode is equal to memory pc um, minus op. So mode is not currently in use, but will be very soon here. How soon? This soon. Uh, mode is greater than zero. There we go. So that's how we check um, if we're in immediate mode or not. Now, what is this down here? Op is equal to memory PC. Did I recently introduce that? I don't think that's right. So yeah, there we go. If while, oh, I'm sorry, no, yeah, here we go. There's our loop. Um, while op is not equal to 99. So this is why I declared it as a var, is because it does change with each iteration. And here is it changing again. Uh, so 
we've redefined op and mode. Nice. Um, actually, let's do it the dumb way. There we go. Divide by 100, mod 100. There we, that way there can be no confusion about what's what. Um, so that helps. That keeps things succinct here. So we got a step with the operation of sum. We got a step with the operation of product. Um, we still have our old program from yesterday where everything's in the same mode that it originally was in because none of the op codes have changed. We've just added new ones. Uh, so if I were to run this from yesterday, it would still run. It would still produce the same uh, output as it produced the other day. There's a solution we had from the other day that's still intact. Um, so what's new is our new ability to output stuff. So where is a really simple program? <laughs> For example, here's a sample input. Um, so this first multiplies. Uh, wait, yeah, this does a multiplication and then, well, that's unfortunate. Um, and what's unfortunate about this is that it does not produce an output. It just terminates. 1,002, 4, 3, 433. Um, wait, have we, no, there's the opcode, there's the three parameters, and there's the, oh, then we produce a 99 and terminate. Okay, so that is a way, it is a valid test. So if this doesn't hang forever, and hopefully it doesn't, uh, then we've done good. Thankfully, um, no, this is a really good test. Um, it shows that I've not done my stuff right. So now we've got to introduce this no notion of a mode here. Um, so here I called mode an int, or a boolean. Here I'm going to have multiple modes, one for each memory address. Uh, but that's not going to work so well. So we have the I'm not sure whether to put the mode before or after the program counter. We'll try putting it before. Um, so, yeah, memory false p1, memory false p2. And we're going to change that in a second, but um, memory mode program counter, etc. Actually, this is uh, already starting to indicate how I can improve the structure of my program um, by passing mode into each of these things. Um, yeah, I see. So if mode were mutable, passed across the function boundaries, things would work better. <laughs> Damn it. Um, so now the way I read the mode, so see, so we always do like the mod 10 and then divide by 10 and mod 10 and divide by 10 and such to get the respective um, mode for each thing. <sighs> I'm disappointed. <laughs> really, I am. 
All right. Well. Yeah. So we're just going to get the mode here. Pass that in. And if mode exceeds zero, we're going to get P. This is disgusting. Um, all right. Uh, so this is going to be mode mod 10. And this is going to be mode over 10. Mod, or Yeah, even mode over 10 will work. Ideally, that would be mo this should actually be mode over 10 mod 10. Ay, ay, ay. That's how you read one digit of the mode at a time. I don't care for that, but it functions. So if mode exceeds zero, just return the value. Otherwise, return memory at value, at address. Um, that's sad. All right, um, but no, I was also suggesting that this operation splitting the mode and op into two separate things should actually just be part of each of these steps. That doing this within the context of my for loop is making me cry. Uh, but I don't know. There's got to be a way to return a union type out of a function in Kotlin. Really, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, Kotlin function union return. And this is something that's going to be in Scala soon. Um, and I hope it makes its way across other languages and such. But the idea of being able to return um, a structure uh, which contains multiple values is useful. Um, so this is part of the language design discussion for Kotlin, if I use the word union. Return multiple values. That's still part of a Kotlin discussion. Destructuring declarations. Print line, name, print line, age. Oh. Wait. Okay. Um. <sighs> Can I do variable declarations, not just value declarations? Um. That are of that form? I wonder. I'm still missing something here. Does this even run while I'm thinking about all the other stuff I could be doing here? Does this run to completion? This does run to completion, so the one where you multiply the 33 by a 3 did what it was supposed to do. Um, so I'm wondering, can I do var a comma b is equal to 0 comma 1? Let's see. Expecting end parenthesis. Um... Yeah, I'm not sure if I can do multiple assignment here. You can do this with values, uh, with a destructuring declaration, but um, you can do de destructuring things in maps. <laughs> I think I need to write a function for this too work. Um, but I don't know if a function can return multiple values. Fun g is equal to 1, 2. Um, yeah, 
I don't know if this is valid. Return an int int. Can I not do this? Function g without a body. Yeah, I don't know. Um, do I need to like make a data class? Multiple return types from a function. Java doesn't support this, does Kotlin? JVM does not allow for returning more than one value from functions, so all the best we can do is return a pair or a, top, a triple or whatever. Uh, so if I want to define my own data type, and maybe I do, that data type could be returned. Um, Kotlin data class. So I'm trying to remember how this works. A data class contains multiple things. So we call data class um, <laughs> instruction, really. Um, apparently, this is idiomatic there. Value mode int value of opcode int. All right, there we go. We've produced a thing called instruction, and I can further expand this if I so desire, which I really don't want to. Um, so then I can say I can have a function which returns an instruction fun f uh, value v of type int is equal to instruction of um, v, I don't know. Really, this there's the problem here is that you could have an instruction. Um, you could have an instruction that has two parameters, and you could have an instruction that has four parameters, and the way you parse the mode it depends on the number of parameters. That's the mess here. Like this mod one hundred is incorrect. Um, well, no, is it? <sighs> I'm rethinking things already. So write instruction is never an immediate mode. A read instruction could be. So could 13 be a read instruction? That's what I'm wondering. It's this discussion about mode. The opcode is a two digit number. It's always a two digit number. So, yeah, basing this on a hundred is fine. Now, could I have a constructor for my data class that takes a singular value. I think so. Um, and really, I'm not looking for this separation here. Um, that's not what I'm looking for. 
I want memory PC to be read as an instruction, and then I want to be able to get its mode, and I want to be able to get its opcode. So, um, this is going to take a value um, something, and it's going to have a I don't know, could have a fun op is equal to v mod 100. And it could have a fun mode is equal to v divided by 100. That could work. Yeah, in Python you just return a tuple. <laughs> yeah, you're also working on it. You don't have to worry too much about it because modes are missing. You can't assume it's mode zero. Yeah, you're right. I was just concerned like that 13 could potentially come in and like no, it can't. Um, that it would have to be 103 if we're doing a read instruction in immediate mode. Um, so. Uh, all right, so here we go. Mode is equal to instruction at memory PC. And while mode.op is not equal to 99, uh, if mode.op is 1, do the thing. No, I'm sorry. Mode is a bad name for this. I is not a particularly great name either. Um, okay, first we're going to rename this, and then we're going to rename it again. Um... So now we rename it a second time. There we go. And while i.mode is not equal to 99, no, if while i.op, if i.op is 1, if i.op is 2, uh, if i.op is 3, and if i.op is 4, do the following. And here, get i.mode. And these other places we want to get i.mode um, because I've not separated things very well. Um, all right. And then we want i is equal to instruction at, of memory at address pc. There we go. That suffices. Ew. <laughs> um, so we keep doing stuff with the program counter. We actually now know, based on i.op, how much the program counter should advance by. Um, so, yeah, we can start moving things from where we define them down here to higher up. Um, like sum and product can get moved into the instruction class. Although no, you don't need them here. Um, so fun step pc int is equal to ew. Ew, well, um, the match of op uh, 
No, it's not Matchavop. It's whatever the... <laughs> oh my god. What was the thing we used the other day that had like the arrow syntax? And we stopped using it. When? When of op? Yeah, right? Must be exhaustive. Add a necessary else branch. All right. One. It's going to be PC plus one. Actually, no, we just wanted to find the step amount. Two, one, three, one. Yeah, this is not correct at all. Um, step by four, by four, by two, by two. This doesn't need the program counter. Um, and else zero. Okay, apparently that's not supported. Else zero. Um, no, I did add an else branch. Did I not? <sighs> All right, how do I do this? Kotlin when else. If, when, for, while, etc., etc. When. Oh, you put the else right in here. That works. All right. Um, can I do multiple matches within there? Yep. So one or two, do that, three or four, do that. There's probably a mathematical function to figure that one out. <laughs> uh, but no. All right, and then we say uh, PC plus equals step. I dot step. And we don't need to step here all the damn time anymore. Halt already halts. Um, then we don't need the damn braces, but they were here to begin with, but I don't care for them. All right, delete that brace and this one. And you'll note that this is starting to look like maybe I should have done a when here also. Um, can I do a while when? Is that a thing? Probably not. Uh, oh, do while is a thing. That's cool. Not necessary, but still good to know. Um, all right. When um, I dot op. Now I'm going to guess that some of this stuff is not valid. Wait, that's valid Kotlin. Is this valid Kotlin? Okay, that's spiffy. Um, all right, three, do whatever the heck I was doing down here. Interesting that this can do more than just um, what I think Java supports, which is, uh, or what Java, 14, I think, is aiming to support. Uh, this can actually execute methods here, um, even if they don't necessarily return the same data type. Okay, I wish my earlier computer had done that. Wouldn't have had to type all those ifs and else's. All right, so we got some codes. <laughs> um, 
and in all cases we want a step and um, i is equal to instruction at the next memory thing and this yeah now i could change instruction here no no no, no. i could like have a stateful program instead of stuffing it all into main i could have a computer uh, that takes the initial instruction and remain retains its own memory and does stuff but um, right now I have this all stuffed into main have I broken uh, my tests hopefully not this does still terminate does still return the same number as yesterday um, all right uh, val input equals one all right isn't that great um, so I'm guessing that's going to change with part two of this problem if I had to guess. All right, so we got an example. There was another example program here. This is a valid program that's 1101 100 minus 140, which will write a 99, in, which is the result, into position 4. And because that 99 is a valid halt instruction, uh, this is considered a valid terminating program. Uh, so, let's stuff that program in here. And just verify this does indeed halt. And while that's going, um, I get my next puzzle input. Alright, here we go. Here's the big enchilada. Boop. All right, let's go back. Now, uh, I don't know that I need to do this looping thing, nor do I need to do this check. After providing one to the only input instruction and after passing all the tests. Now, passing all the tests is going to require doing something to addresses, whatever and whatever. Um, uh, so, the output instruction indicating how far the result of the test was from the expected value, where zero means successful. Um, so, this output instruction uh, it, it will run a single output instruction indicating how far the result of the test was from working correctly and this is not asking me to print line it it's asking me to store that output so that can later be retrieved and compared to uh, whether that is a zero or not so that is literally an exit code. Um, uh, var output is equal to zero. And then we're going to return the output instead of returning memory zero. Now did return memory zero, yeah. Return memory zero had some connotations with these other programs. So So that's disappointing. That's disappointing. So that means I can't do my earlier tests anymore. Or at least these execute, but now they're going to return different values than they used to return because returning memory at address 0 is no longer interesting. They do still execute, they do still terminate. Um, So now do I have to provide some pr 
parameters into here somehow. After providing one to the only input instruction and passing all the tests, what's the diagnostic code? I'll we'll start by requesting from the user the ID uh, provided a 1, the ID for the unit. We'll then provide the diagnostic tests. Like parameter modes function correctly. For each test, it will run an output instruction, etc. Um, so I'm not seeing anything here suggesting a noun and a verb anymore. I know a noun and a verb were a really big aspect of. Um, problem two, and they're just completely absent here. Um, Flustered. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I don't see anything about a noun or a verb here. So do I just get rid of the noun and the verb? What are they for? Um, we have an execution function. which assigns the values of memory one and memory two. And I guess I comment those out. All right, that's the load. So instead of doing this execute load thing, it's fine for me to have a load function. I'm just not gonna use it, apparently. Um, Uh, so, execute program takes what? A mutable list, and I'm providing a list. Um, okay. Yeah, I apologize for that. <laughs> Sorry about that. We will work on that one. Also welcome. Oh, I'm sorry. Now I've connected two and two. Wow, that took me a while to connect the dots on that. But yes, um, now I understand. Oh my goodness. How long did it take me? It took me like two hours to connect that username to where I had been alerted to this username earlier today. That's cool. All right, so yeah, no, I do uh, fully intend to like get my MIDI keyboard hooked up at some point. Um, um, it might take a while. I lost the power adapter for my MIDI keyboard. And I do have a piano, but I'm like way out of practice. I I don't know, every pianist who takes it seriously uh, claims to be out of practice or claims to spend like six hours a day practicing. Or they just don't say that they spend six hours a day practicing, but um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so I will say um, yeah, some a couple, at least one other developer took a really strong interest to Kotlin. Um, and my reason for exploring it so deeply is I think it could solve some problems that are endemic to how things have been coded for a number of years. Um, there have been two problems in particular that just repeatedly bite us over and over. One of them 
is runtime exceptions, such as dereferencing null, and the other is exception handling, which we don't have a consistent pattern for, and Kotlin, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I figure, um, I did some looking at that and some looking at Scala. I'm excited about what's going to come with Dottie and Scala 3. Um, but yes, if I can get Bill on board and if we can get developers on board with, it's going to take some discipline to get this implemented in a way that's not going to continue to bite us in the rear end in a different language. Um, the only way we're going to be able to use this and understand it and not have exceptions happening left and right because of it is if we can stop using null uh, or stop returning null and also if we can stop throwing exception because you can't do like all these map reduce all these other functional programming things all of this degrades very quickly if you start throwing exceptions just like then the ordering in which things evaluate becomes critically important and so you just like you can't do functional programming if you're throwing exceptions so there needs to be a way to write software effectively in uh, this language without having to resort to using null and without having to resort to using exceptions and i like that you can enforce things like immutability like here's an immutable data class where it took this uh, value this cannot change throughout the lifetime of uh, this object or class. Uh, I'm sorry, throughout the uh, lifetime of each object of this class type. Um, so I know like this V is not going to change and I can call mode as many times as I want to and I can call step as many times as I want to. I'm going to get back the same numbers every time. Um, so this being able to handle concurrency and parallelism and understand other people's code it's just a tremendously good thing uh, so that's kind of where i'm coming from but i don't think this is going to work if we continue making the same strategic mistakes in a new software if we keep dealing with null as if it's a, a real object and having to figure out what's the right way to handle null in every context, switching to Kotlin's not going to help. If we keep throwing exceptions, um, switching to Kotlin just offers a different syntax. It, a Kotlin doesn't really enforce um, exception checking the same way that Java does. And even Java, like you can throw runtime exceptions and that's just terrible because there's nothing enforcing their handling. Um, so I've recently had to fix a couple things in baselib um, because runtime exceptions were being thrown and unpredictable behavior was happening, things that we didn't expect. Uh, so yeah, that, if we can get out of this mode where exceptions force us to code in a very specific style, uh, we can start considering other things like functional programming. So that's kind of my take. I'm going to pitch it again and again and again to the developers and maybe show off this advent of code stuff and try to explain that, okay, it takes some learning to get used to it, but reading the code's not hard. And if you want to write in it, it's there's plenty of examples and there will be more and more of it. So... Um, I may be too optimistic, I don't know. But I, I think if we continue coding the same way we always have, it's going to be a problem. Uh, the Kotlin's not going to solve it. Um, so... Um... This is asking, after we've passed all the tests, what's the diagnostic code? 
all outputs were zero except the diagnostic. <laughs> uh, well, that's interesting. Uh, so this is really putting the onus on me to check throughout the execution of this program. Um, have we gotten zero every time except for the last time? Uh, how do we know if it was the last time? One way would be to check, am I getting a request to assign output uh, when my value's not zero? That could be a way. <laughs> but yeah, instead of print line here, this is going to be output is equal to whatever. Uh, right? Because it's the read instruction. It's this new opcode 4. Yes. Yeah. I know. Like, recently I've been uh, tasked with trying to uh, make unit testing and all this more viable and better embraced and whatever. Uh, so I'm actually kind of heading up the front with unit testing and uh, at least in terms of uh, the LME product. Um, at least I think I'm heading that up. I don't think there's anybody else on that. There might be folks on other projects other than directly LME that might be doing good stuff with TDD. But I'm just glad, like, recently I was able to turn unit tests on in all the builds. Um, so if anybody had bothered to write unit tests, they should run and they should pass. And if they don't pass, you can't merge the code that you're trying to merge. That is, like, a baseline we need to start from. And then we can start thinking about integration testing and such. And it's been a tremendous headache this year trying to figure out how to even do testing with that software. Um, um, <laughs> but no, I was able to, I did show um, the team um, the work that did with uh, enabling unit tests. I spoke about it at a very high level, didn't really show it off much. Um, been struggling a lot with the other things I'm supposed to be working on, so um we'll be making a trip next week uh get to see jason and such and jason and bill spend some time hang out learn some stuff um so that'll be good um hopefully that'll get me onboarded with everything that that team's developed this year or at least enough of it that i can be productive at what i'm a uh, product i'm supposed to be working on yeah, I understand. Actually, if you find, I have have shared with Brian, I'm also a contributor to an open source chess server. Um, so I have shared with him my uh, contact information on that site as well. Um, and most of my uh, usage of this channel has been doing chess on that server um it'd be cool to have a yeah lee chess is the site <laughs> oh light lightning is ready he is so ready he would be ready like if i stuck up in the little corner here he'd be like yeah uh let's go um but that's not what i'm up to today <laughs> uh so I mean, I could stick the little board up there, could animate while we're trying to solve some problems, but um, I really want to get through this puzzle and the second half of it, and I'll probably be... I would like to have a rematch with Brian, but I think I'm going to be overwhelmed next week. Um, just because there's six months of stuff to learn in three days. So, uh, it's going to be tricky. Um, 
I totally appreciate the rematch offer and do want to offer it, but like, I don't know that I have enough time to learn everything I'm going to need to learn while I'm down there. There's going to be a lot of learning. I've been floundering a bit the last, I don't know. There's just so many different sets of terminology and picking up um, all the terms and mapping that to the code and back uh, has been tricky. I'm getting better at figuring out what the mapping is. Um, but wait, what's this? Why is this underlined? Um, but yeah, like learning what an alias and an instance and an installation and an LME and like there's always different terms for things. And that seems just a little bit overwhelming. Um, all right. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess each step of the way here. I could try to print the output or something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, safe. Yeah, thank you. I was going to say safe travels to YouTube, but I'm the one traveling. I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, good to see you. Uh, best of luck if you do end up doing that. And see you next week. How was uh, day four? Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Yep. Yeah, uh, who was it? Uh, it was Eric, I believe, who had uh, mentioned uh, who you are. <laughs> All right, see ya. Yeah, how was day four is asking white lightning uh, day four wasn't so bad uh i actually addressed day four today at the first half of the stream and since my head is underwater trying to pick this up um uh, i don't know when i dot up uh, print line of i dot op dot to string. I really need to put some unit tests in here, and I just have completely failed to do that. <laughs> One took you ten minutes. Two took you two hours because you misunderstood it. Yeah. Yeah, that's understandable. So we got a zero and a zero and a zero, and like these are all our magnificent opcodes. Um, I'm thinking I missed something here. Okay, well, first of all, I know these tests were great, but let's dispense with those for the moment and just focus on the challenge at hand. I think I'm still going to get all zeros as my opcodes. Yep. So... Got all zeros. We got a three and a one, and then our opcodes just all switch to zeros. Um, so did I need to load the program the same way that other programs need to be loaded? Like, what's going on here? Three. Um, takes the value at 125. 1 takes the value 225. Wait, 225. Excuse me? What's this 2 at the beginning? Oh, wait, no, so 3 is the opcode and 1 is the opcode. Our opcode of 1 takes these 4. Yeah, no, this problem... I haven't done previous years' advent of code, but this problem sucks. 
Like, you don't do this on day five. Or you do this on day five if your traffic, if your website's getting too much traffic and you want people to stop doing this stuff. That's when you do this on day five. It's, this is ridiculously evil. Um, just saying. All right, so we get a three, a 225, get a one, and all this stuff. This has a six and a six, and then here's 1100. So this has an opcode of zero. What the hell is an opcode of zero? Well, I guess this is not supposed to be an opcode of zero. What, what should this do? Three at 225 means, uh, I think, Let me think more clearly. Three is a read. Um, three takes a single integer as input and saves it to the position uh, given as its only parameter. So this takes the one, and saves it at position 225. And then one takes the value at 225, which is a one, and adds it to six, puts this in six, and so this 1100 is supposed to become a 1, not a 0. That's what's going wrong here. OK. Um, so that's my problem. Now, whether the value at position 225 is a 0? Um, no. 3 is take an input, stick it at 225, and that input is a 1. And then this is saying take the 225 and the 1. And um, since this is an opcode of 1 and not a 101 or some other thing, this is just a straight add the thing at 225, which is a 1, and the thing at 6, which is an 1100. So you end up with an 1101 here. Um, So there's the 1101. Uh, we have a V over 100 and a V mod 100. Oh, and yeah, here we have an else of zero. And this is where in Java you'd normally like throw an exception or say something bad has happened um, when you've got an unexpected value. But here I just put a zero, which is not good. Which is not ideal, we'll say. Um, uh, can I do else break here? I don't think that's valid. Consider using labels to do breaking if you're going to do that stuff. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, so while i.op is in 1 through 4, that'll work. Yeah, I can't blame you for giving up on this. Um, yeah, co-workers are abnormally interested in this stuff. So I am trying to not fall behind, but I also like the notion of trying to actually be entertaining and having an audience while doing this, so I'm crazy. <laughs> I, I think if I had to do this all by myself, it would be as maddening as what I normally do at work. So we're going to have fun. We're going to have an audience make it entertaining and we'll get through it. <laughs> but we're not giving up. Uh, I'd rather do that here than at work. Because like here we can have fun, be entertaining and stuff.
All right, so. Yeah, three, one, zero. Wait. Wait, wait, wait. I'm confused. All right, and we're going to do another print up here. Actually, why don't I do this? We can print the op, do whatever we're going to do, print the op one last time. So yeah, we're gonna get the same out. Oh, three one zero zero. So zero isn't even an op code. This should definitely be a one. Um, I'm not sure how I effed this up. Uh, so if mode exceeds zero, use the value at p. Else use memory p. Uh, our right will take an input of one. So there's our input. Wait, do I have this wrong? Memory at program counter plus one. I really did need a write function because I'm too dumb to write to the correct address. I figured out what I effed up. All right, so we're going to define right because I'm an idiot. Um, not really. So here, this is going to do a thing. Memory at address p is equal to value. Um, Except it's equal to input. So the one thing this didn't need was a mode. Um, but yes, I did have to write um, an instruction there. Okay. I don't think this makes anything more readable. I'm going to go back and collapse it. But um, this is not memory at PC plus one. This is memory at memory at PC plus one. So yeah, I did need to get my addresses out of um, instruction. I need instruction to actually return the addresses uh, that we're interested in probably do need to move all these operations into uh, some sort of computer that accepts instructions and such, but um, this is still legible. So this should run, hopefully. We can at least see the opcodes as they run now. That's just kind of cool. 223. All right. Um, so we got rid of this print line, got rid of this print line. We can uh, re-enable these tests to make sure I haven't broken anything. Oh man, 223. I don't know if I believe that, but I'm willing to try believing it. Um. Now one thing I could do, um, I mean I could validate that each step of the way that this output is valid. Um, output is equal to read. Oh, why am I assigning this? I could just print it every step of the way. Why am I assigning this? Am I using read for any other purpose right now? Uh, 
Um. <laughs> yeah, so read is already complicated enough. Um, so my original notion of uh, print line of read here is fine. And it's fine if I don't have a var output. And it's fine if the program returns memory of at address 0. Even though this program won't be using that memory address 0, I can manually verify this output and see if it's all zeros leading up to the 223. 224, 223. So, no, it's not. Okay. Um, so this raises other questions, doesn't it? <laughs> so now do I need my program loader? We do have a load function that can put a noun and a verb. Um, I'm not seeing anything about a noun and a verb here. Uh, but after providing one to the only input instruction and passing all the tests, what diagnostic code does the program produce? Well, so we got some funky diagnostic codes here, didn't we? So the print line of read of memory I mode PC plus one. Is PC plus one the correct way to read this? I'm not sure. A read instruction is, wait, no, opcode 4 is what? Outputs the value of its only parameter. Um, so it would output the value at address 50. Uh, so we do a read. I'm not sure if this output can have a mode or not. So parameters that an instruction writes to will never be in immediate mode. However, uh, this here could be in immediate mode. Also, I'm being dumb because I'm not interested in um, PC plus one. I'm interested in memory at PC plus one. Should we try that again? Oh my goodness. Close enough. No, the three comes from something else I did down here where I'm doing a print line. So yes, uh, if I get rid of that print line, then this does what we expect it to do. I'm literally about to go through the input in Notepad. Yeah, that's um, what I was starting to do there. Um, Okay, I'm still flustered because reasons. We're returning memory zero. Oh, we're returning three here. I don't know what that three is about. Um. This is the only print instruction. And we're definitely getting some non-zero value there. And then we're getting a three. And I am disappointed. Yeah, doing this by hand might be efficient. 
as opposed to doing what I'm doing. What I'm doing may be inefficient is what I'm trying to say. There's only a finite number of instructions. There's only so many ways you can get it wrong. So the value at PC plus one could be used to do a lookup. I think here um, this read instruction probably has the same flaw I had elsewhere. If mode is exceeding zero, use p, else use memory p. Um, so mode here, do I do a mo divide by 10 or divide by 100 uh, to process the mode? I dot mode. I dot mode is v over 100. So I'm thinking I'm thinking this there's something malicious in this input. And the goal is not to compare this to zero, but it to get if mode mod 10 is equal to 1, then we need the value, otherwise you need to do the lookup. Um, I'm thinking we got something other than a 10 there, and I'm not pleased. Um, no, no, I'm wrong. That'd be malicious if they were to do it some other way. Um, but that's funny how we get all these zeros and then we get this thing and then a three. Um, so we definitely did not pass all the tests, right? Well, I don't know. I'm not sure anymore. Do any of these tests actually output stuff? Yeah, I didn't think so. 138, 18007. Yeah. Uh, so, that's great. Um, <sighs> so, now what? I'm not using the program loader yet. I'm not sure if I need to load using the noun and the verb or not. It would have been nice to have other simple tests, um, but maybe I've, I don't know, become complacent and expecting the website to provide all the tests when I can start providing them. That sucks. Yeah, no, I, I don't think there's too much to this. Something about it's not right. Something about my coding is not right. So we were able to define the i.step here, and that was great. What else can we do? I mean, I could make input a function. There's no harm in making input a function because they're probably going to change the definition of this function very soon. Um, uh, 
So what we have we have references to methods here. Yeah. Fun input memory is going to be a mutable list of int. Um, and PC is going to be an int. Uh, we're going to say, oh, uh, memory uh, at PC plus one is equal to one. And that's going to be the our implementation. Uh, I mean, why don't I go? Why don't I bother putting a mode in here? There's no harm in it. It's not going to be used, but it's not going to break anything other than my feelings. Uh, yeah. There we go. There's idiomatic Kotlin. So we got a step. We've got a step. Step is a bad name. Um, no, I've already got compute. Compute is no, I've got execute. I don't have a compute. Um, rename. Shift F6 is the macro. Uh, there we go. You got the answer. 42. It's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Okay, so this provide a warning that I provided a parameter I'm not using. Um, that's cool. Yeah, so we'll get rid of the unused parameter. You win, Kotlin. We'll do things your way. I'm not sure what that big scary message was a second ago. Val in oh, right. So we defined val input equals one, and then we're trying to call a function that we called input. Three. Well, there you have it. The answer to everything is three. That's it. That's the answer. Can't question it. That doesn't make any sense. Wait, yeah, the reason it doesn't make sense is because we don't want to assign that to one. We want to assign memory at memory at program counter one to one. Um, that's why it's not three. So now can I get back this scary looking output? Yep, there it is. <sighs> So now what? Mode mod 10, mode divided by 10 mod 10. I'm not seeing what we do next. Here we step by four, here we step by two, here we don't step. There really isn't a need for an else case because other values are invalid, but uh, I don't know. <sighs> well, 
what else can I do? I could define a function called output that just does print line. Uh, it might make this easier to read. It's not going to fix anything. Uh, so we got an input. Let's go declare output. So we got a program counter. We will need a mode for this instruction. And this is just going to be um, that's not the real definition. This is the real definition. Um, oh, uh, so here we've already read the instruction mode. We just need to pass it along. And uh, memory PC plus one might be wrong. Maybe that should be PC plus three or something. We'll figure it out in just a second. Um, output of memory i mode no pc plus one is correct uh, except here to be idiomatic we're just going to pass uh, the program counter and let the function figure out what to do with the program counter um, and what that does is it takes the value of pc plus one and we'll do a read either yeah. So I'm still confused like why it says um that the opcode will always be two digits. I'm really starting to question this. The opcode is a two-digit number based only on the ones and tens digit of the value. That is, the opcode is the rightmost two digits of the first value in an instruction. Parameter modes are single digits, one per parameter, read right to left from the opcode. So the first parameter's mode is in the hundreds digit, second is in thousands, etc. So 1002 is a valid, um, yeah. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, parameter modes are zero in the hundreds digit, one in the thousands digit, and zero in the ten thousands digit. Instruction multiplies the first two parameters. First is in position mode, as always. The second is in immediate mode which just has the value. The result is 99, etc., etc. Uh, so, now that's all valid. Some notes. Um, oh, thank you, Stay Healthy Bot. Yes, um, I really should consider wrapping this up even though I haven't solved it, which is frustrating, but uh, sometimes healing is necessary. On the other hand, I'm this deep into it, I'm not happy. <laughs> uh, so maybe I should keep going while I have some energy in this? Um, I don't know. Also, Let's put this back. Just to verify that we're in this effed up state. Well, we did exit. We did get a three back. I'm still very displeased. Because this indicates an unsuccessful test. We should not get to output values unless this three here is somehow printed out as a result of something we're doing here and I can't see that being the case like here we're calling execute with this list 
I don't get it. <laughs> Something's missing. So the memory, the instruction mode, and the program counter. Instructions which write. Could that be the problem? No. Because I'm not silly enough to like change the addressing mode of a write operation. Um, write is always going to write to uh, the address as specified in that way. Um, wouldn't hurt to create a write function. So what now? We're going to make a function. We're going to call it write. Um, And it's going to take some value, some parameter int, and we're going to say, um, except this is not a program counter anymore. This is an address. So the memory at address is equal to parameter. Yay, look at me, I've created something ridiculous. Yeah, I didn't want to create this write function because it's literally just uh, the assignment operation. Um, and there is no addressing mode for that. So there's no reason to have a function that implements something that's just an, that just aliases a built-in function. That the built-in function is already good. <sighs> so... Um, now there's no reason for me to declare these as var instead of val. These values do not change. So these can be val. Um, so one thing I could do with input here would be to declare val uh, p1 is equal to memory of pc plus 1. And then say that memory at p1 is equal to 1. That might help with making this more legible ever so slightly. Not really, but we can pretend. I have an imagination. Um, So we have only one input instruction, and we sh there should only be one input instruction. Um, all right. So what do I want to do here? I guess verify how many times we get an input instruction, right? That wouldn't hurt. How many input instructions do we have? It's just one, surely, right? Yep, there's the single input instruction. And we're providing a one in there. And the right instruction doesn't do anything stupid, right? Integers can be negative. Um, 
Store the result in position four. Yeah, that's fine. I don't think that's a challenge. Hopefully opcodes and um, that sort of thing can't be negative, I would hope. So I am thinking I just need to download my puzzle input again. There's the possibility I may have input it incorrectly. I'm just struggling with like how else could this have failed? List of this set of values. I'm sure there's a million ways this could have failed, but um, do I really need to like reintroduce the noun and verb shit? that doesn't make any sense and your existing int code computer all right we're gonna go look back at this and then part two of this is that um, int code programs are given as a list of integers opcodes are instructions so we have an instruction pointer um, once the program is halted, etc., the its output is available at address zero. Also, just like before, um, each time you try a pair of inputs, make sure you first reset the computer's memory to the values in the program. Uh, the inputs should still be provided by replacing the values at addresses one and two, just like before. The value in address 1 is called the noun, and the value placed in address 2 is called the verb. Each of the two values should will be between 0 and 99, inclusive. Um, so... Uh, I don't like that this is ambiguous. I'm almost certain that this noun and verb stuff doesn't apply, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. You should determine what pair of inputs, yeah, when the program is halted, its output's available at address zero. I am supposing that that has to be unrelated, but what else could be wrong? Going right to left, parameter modes are 0, 1, and 0. This instruction multiplies its first two parameters. The first foreign position mode um, works like it did before. Its value is the value stored at address 4, which is 33. The second parameter, 3 in immediate mode, simply has a value of 3. I don't know whether I should just plug this in, because this can't be right. 
because we had a failure. Yeah, all my tests are passing. Um, they're all finishing without error. And then there's this last one, which outputs a whole bunch of zeros, and then this error code, and then a three. If all outputs were zero, except the diagnostic code, the diagnostic program ran successfully. The diagnostic code is supposed to be the final output. Um, how far this was from the expected value. For zero means the test was successful. Non-zero, indicate that function is not working correctly. Check the instructions that were run before the output instruction to see which one failed. So the program did everything it was supposed to do up to this point. Then after this point, it did something that it wasn't supposed to do. Okay, so I could actually intersperse more output between um, these printouts. <sighs> That's disappointing. No, the point is well taken though. Um, that after a problem happens, that's the best opportunity to figure out what you're doing incorrectly. Um, so we have compute, compute, input and output. Um, so here, compute I guess here I want to print, if I can, um, Wait, so we did an output there. Um, yeah, there's no harm in printing extra stuff. Two spaces plus I dot mode plus uh, space plus I dot up plus space plus PC. Can I slice uh, this? I don't know. Uh, wait, plus memory at PC. Yeah, let's do that. Oh wait, we've already we're already dumping that. Let's start with that. So between the zeros, um, we have a problem. So one, two, ten, one, zero, one, eleven, one, eleven, one, oh four. So this O four worked. After this O four there was a problem. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. You just have to like do a lot of dumping output and troubleshooting uh, what's going on. The hint that they provide that you should actually just look at where things are going wrong in greater detail uh, makes pretty good sense. Um, oh, I know. I should look at memory PC to PC. No. Well, all right, fine. I can do this in separate steps. Memory PC plus one, plus two, plus three. 
probably just concatenate that together, because otherwise it's going to be an ungodly mess to decipher. Now, there might not be a PC in plus three, uh, a PC plus three in some cases. Um, so my program might tank. Yep, out of bounds, because I'm printing a plus three where there's nothing out there. So uh, let's just fill with three zeros at the end. That's not going to change the functionality of this program if I start padding. All right, um, that shouldn't have changed functionality. Um, we've got a pretty critical problem if uh, we're going way beyond the end of this array. If I have some problems uh, due to overstepping the end, that's not good. Yeah. Index out of bounds. Oh, it's failing on my earlier stuff. Whatever, I don't care about these anymore. These used to pass, they probably will pass in the future. Um, yeah, so. Here's the 102, 8, 223 twice. And then, oh, Kotlin does have slice. Yeah, this absolutely is way more difficult than every other problem we've encountered so far. Yeah, that's no question. Um, so 4, 223, 99... Those last few things don't really matter. What's this? An opcode of four. Do I even have an opcode? Yeah, I do have an opcode of four. Four is output. I'll put the value at position 223. Um, so I'm going to assume that the value, yeah. And then we hit 99, and 99 is just stop right there don't do anything. Um, is the 99 getting folded into the 4 here? Is that what this is about? I don't know. When i.op is not 99, do some stuff. And then here we are returning memory at address zero, even though we don't need to, but it shouldn't break anything. Yeah, this value at address 223, 102. All right, 102. This is a multiply instruction that says take the values at 8 and 223 uh, with the 1 meaning for this parameter, the 8, put that in immediate mode. Um, so use that as a number instead of using the value that's in that position. Um, yeah, why don't I print out one more thing here? So regardless of what all those other values are, I am curious what's at position 223. Somehow that number just became a bit more relevant. 
So whatever's in position 223 is probably some ginormous something. So we want to take this number, multiply it by 8. And then this 1001 says take the values of 227, 224, and 7. Take the value 7 and add it to 224. Am I doing an absolute value anywhere in this program? I hope not. No. There's no absolute value anywhere here. So take the 224 and a literal 7 and um, add them together. And then take these values, add them together. And so I guess 224 must have been empty. I'd like to know what was in position 224. So what was there? Yeah, this is way more than enough. This is enough for a lifetime <laughs> and then some so address 224 usually contains something that's not a very much interest I guess it's a small number we got some small numbers in 224 we got a 0 and then we add a 7 take that 7 and add it to the other number okay the 25 and a 15 and you multiply those together Put that into position 225. Um, it's a 275 that goes there. And then you take the values of 64 and 73. Take those literal values and stuff them. In, or you add them together and put the result in position 225. And then you take the values of 223. Uh, and you take the value position 223 and output it. Um, so yeah, that's where we get this disgusting code from. Now this position 223 seems particularly relevant in the execution here. When does that get changed? So the first time it gets assigned is here. Or the 101 and the minus 1716. Um, I'll put a 224. No. No, no, that's just the address. There's a 6 in this position, and then this number just keeps going up. We got 421 and a 3373. I take the 3373, and then what? We're adding a. <sighs> I'm confused. So we're taking a literal 57, adding it to whatever's a position 43, uh, storing the result in position 224. And the result is a 5. And then we're taking a literal negative 147 and a positive 224, or I'm sorry, address 224. That doesn't seem right. We are adding a literal negative 147 to the value in address 224, storing in address 224. Um, oh yeah, so we do negate. We end up with a zero there. That's all well and good. So then we have a 223. 
which we are doing a multiplication. Uh, yeah, 223 just, I'm not sure what's going on there. The fact that like there's these zeros in between does nothing to inspire confidence in me. I, I have no confidence in that zero printout because I'm not sure what the value in position 223 is supposed to be. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's not supposed to be what we're seeing, but I don't know what it is supposed to be. Oh, well done. Congratulations. I'm dumping more and more output to my terminal and just getting progressively more confused. But hey, <laughs> that makes sense. It would be hard for them to F this one up further. It's not an easy problem. But you would think that for the first week of this challenge, unless their server is getting overloaded, they would try to ease up a bit. Try to encourage as many new people to join and enjoy this. And that's what confuses me. I have this ridiculously large number in position 223, or index 223, in my array. And I don't know what to do about that. This, apple, this suggests that everything's hunky-dory as long as you keep getting zeros printed out. And then I got something printed out at near the end that wasn't a zero. And I got disappointed. Because that's not the diagnostic code. Oh, I'm sorry, we got a 99. 99 was our op code here. And somehow I printed a 3 afterward. I think that's the bug, is that this 3 is getting printed. Maybe my program's doing everything it's supposed to be doing. But where's the 3 coming from? That's what has me confused, I guess. So while i.op is not 99, take the op code, increment the program counter, i is equal to instruction of memory at PC. I'm not seeing anything that could print beyond the bounds of this. Execute does return, but the return value should be ignored. This is a function fun load, but this load is not invoked anywhere. How is my program doing something stupid to return that three at the end? This is driving me bananas. <laughs> I don't get it. And I guess to further troubleshoot this, um, if I get rid of the print line, everything should work as expected. Um, like, there should not be any output now. I would not expect to see a 3 or anything else there. And I do get a 3. Um, but there's nothing in my program that could possibly output that 3. So that's where I'm confused. Is that I did something so extremely boneheaded here somewhere. And I'm just not seeing where I did it. This function is not called. I can get rid of this function. The return value of the application here does not matter. I can dispense with the return value. Uh, 
I just want to know what I did wrong. So I got rid of the return value. I got rid of the extra function. And at least one of those two things had an impact here. Let's try this. Let's keep the return value and see if a 3 gets printed. Yes. So I didn't know that like the evaluation here would actually print a value. I guess that's lesson learned. So I can strip off all this, all these extra zeros I threw on here that have no effect. I can re-enable all these tests, save it, and run it. I'm going to get the same number along with all the other diagnostic codes saying that everything went perfectly. And this is apparently supposed to be my answer. Uh, did the page time out on me? <laughs> uh, please go? Uh, okay, I don't know what I did. We're no closer to saving Santa. We got timed out. Let's try that again. That's the right answer. You are one gold star closer to rescuing Santa. Woo! All right, we spent the last hour struggling over something ridiculous. Um, struggling over my interpretation of Kotlin script and how a return value is parsed, is actually printed because this is a script and not an application. Great. All right, the air conditioner comes online. It's cold air, feels good for a while, but then the test alarms start to go off since the air conditioner can't vent its heat anywhere but back into the spacecraft. It's actually making the air inside the ship warmer. Instead, you'll need to use test to extend the thermal regulators. Fortunately, the diagnostic program is already equipped for this. Unfortunately, your int code computer is not. Your computer is only missing a few opcodes. Jump if true, jump if false, less than and equals. Like all instructions, these instructions need to support parameter modes as described above. Normally, after an instruction is finished, the instruction pointer increases, etc. However, if the instruction modifies the instruction pointer, that value is used and the instruction pointer is not automatically increased. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The standard um, assembly. Um, instead of uh, manipulating the instruction pointer, you just jump and you don't manipulate the instruction pointer after having jumped because you jumped exactly where you wanted to go to. Here are some jump tests that take an input and output zero if the input that that that. Okay. The above example program uses an input instruction to ask for a single number. The program will then output 999 if the input value is below 8, output 1000 if it's equal to 8, and 1001 if it's uh, greater than 8. Uh, this is an input instruction. All right, this time using the test diagnostic program, uh, when it runs its instruction to get the ID of the system test, provide it 5, the ID for the ship's thermal radiator controller. This diagnostic test suite outputs only one number, the diagnostic code. 
what is the diagnostic code for system ID 5? All right. So um, we have execute input int. Um, now I recognize that we call it a function input. Um, so I need a better name than input here. Even though we made a pretty good input function that really was, I'm ashamed of it, but um, so, all right, uh, say I int. Uh, I still am ashamed of that function. Um, well, now here we got I as instruction. Uh, da, 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 da. I need a better variable naming convention. So, I mean, I could call the parameter input and pass it to a function called input, and that would be sad. Um, uh, so what now? We'll call it in. That really doesn't disambiguate either. Um, wait. Okay. How about ID? There we go. There's a name that's not taken yet. All right. So previously, previously on Dragon Ball Z. Um, so our program's still there, still, nope, it's not. No value passed for parameter id. Oh, we lost our id. We still got our ego, but our id is lost. Uh, how did I mess that up? Input, input, pc id memory pc in id is of type int all right where is our first error oh right here all right fine apparently execution now requires uh, an id that's fine um, so yay. Does this compile now? Or does it interpret or whatever? Yes, yeah. Kotlin is so concise. Definitely it is concise. All right. So our four new opcodes are jump if true jump if false less than or equals um, if the first parameter is less than the second parameter it stores one in the position given by the third parameter otherwise it stores zero okay um, so val less int int Turning int is equal to um, uh, a comma b. If a is less than b, one else zero. That's how you define less than here. And we need to give that opcode of seven equals uh, if they're equal uh, do that otherwise return zero all right um, so these will be opcode seven and eight less equal there we go um, so those 
to fall into this category. Um, and then we need jump if true and jump if false. Um, so if the first parameter is non-zero, sets the instruction pointer, else does nothing. So these two, five and six, uh, have a single parameter. And we're going to have a function called jump. Actually, yeah, here, um, that's interesting, isn't it? And can never win. <laughs> can never, ever win. Jeez. Um, okay. Uh, I dot step. So, so far the instruction still does not have visibility to memory. And gradually, this is getting pushed in a direction where I'm forced to know uh, more and more about what's in memory in order to be able to determine things from the instruction. And I still don't like that. It's, uh, I'm guessing this is going to continue as a trend. They're like They don't want me passing pure functions into other functions even though functional composition is awesome. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what to do without this. It's like here we say PC is plus equal to I step, but um, I mean, I could do this twice. I could say five, do something. Uh, Six, do something, and then else PC is incremented by I dot step. Um, wait, but this do nothing instruction, yeah, that's problematic as well. So, yeah. I not step. So, instead, we're going to assign the program counter. Ick. Um, I hate doing this. Based on the value of the program counter, and based on the value. Contained in PC plus one, if there is such an address, which sometimes there might not be, because 99 does not. Uh, this is terrible. Um, this is terrible. Uh, var step, no. Okay, here's another thing I could do. Well, <laughs> well, okay, so I have to define a new program counter variable up here. Uh, yeah, so we... No, I'm forcing myself into a bad style that way. I want to use the FP style if it's possible. Uh, it's going to be a mess, but um, I want to demonstrate that coding things using a functional programming style can be done. Come heck or high water. So, memory, comma, PC. Yeah, 
Now I get that this is problematic. List of int uh, uh, and then it takes the PC, which is an int. equals and then we can't do this we can't use all the syntactic sugar that Kotlin has to offer we can instead say uh, when op So jump if true, and the other is jump if false. Um, oh wait, no, I could still use the when syntax. This is still doable. It continues to get more painful by the moment, but it is doable. Um, five, do your thing. If memory PC plus one, ASDF else PC plus two. What did I have I done wrong? Oh. If it's non zero, and instead of ASDF, it sets the instruction pointer to the value from the second parameter. Um, okay. same thing for six here. Um, let's see, yeah, five and six fall in a special category. So how about that? And this is jump if false. <sighs> Yuck. Yeah, I don't care much for this. Um, so there's got to be some way uh, <laughs> to say for five I want to use not equal to zero, for six I want to use equal to zero. Um, yeah. It's got to be a way to say if condition return this, else return the other thing. I don't care for that, but yeah, I should at least be able to extract this condition and somehow take the rest of this line and say if x this, else that. Um, so at least the PC plus two doesn't have to be repeated a zillion times. Um, well, so I guess I'm going to create a function and call it jump. Um, Yeah, this is where the jump logic belongs. Um, and 
five comma six uh, jump memory PC. Um, now that's still not great because um, well, there's other problems with this too, right? So this uh, is assuming incorrectly that I can just read the parameter because there's still this concept of mode which screws everything up, right? So I can't just read the memory address. I have to be able to uh, read the mode as well. So this is already a terrible place to be in. Um, but okay, uh, we'll pretend that it's fine. It's not. So generally we've said we're going to provide the memory and then the mode and then the program counter. So we can do that here. Um, and so mode will go there. And we'll figure out what to do about mode. Um, oh, we have a read function. Thank goodness. Um, now read will take a p parameter. Uh, perhaps this is where I just say pc plus 2 is my read parameter. Um, and instead of calling this pc, uh, shift f6, we're going to call that p. Um, and we can say if read that. <laughs> I forgot this has two parameters. This has a P1 and a P2. Um, so I really hope that when we get these jump instructions, um, well, no, the jump instruction has to be the correct width. I can't worry about that. There's nothing I could do if that were not the case. If read is not equal to zero, expression is inaccessible from a nested class instruction. Um, If that, this, okay, this just keeps getting worse and worse the more I type. Um, so the solution is to stop typing. <laughs> no, uh, it's really not, but. Um, all right. I call that P1. P2, and this is going to be P2, this is going to be P2, this is going to be P1, and it's still all terrible. Um, else, if these are equal, do it that way. Now, you might ask, why am I... Um, doing all this. So we got the program counter. We're saying PC plus 4, PC plus 2. Um, well, if we're calling our step function, and we are, we have a valid instruction. Oh, but you could have a valid instruction at the end of an input and PC plus 2 could be out of range for some inputs. 
Um, maybe I don't worry about that for now. It's concerning, but maybe I, I can't worry about it yet. Um, I do see that read is defined down here where I can't get access to it. So it's going up here now. Yay. Um, I don't like that. Because this one thing I had created for a very specific purpose is now starting to become a computer. They've kind of forced my hand into making this monolithic class that does everything. And um, I mean, I could stand up against this, right? If I could pass function read as a parameter here, because through an instruction should not have the logic for reading memory. I'm already way down deep in the woods here, and I'd rather just pass um, read as a parameter and call it directly. We're going to try that first, if I could figure out how to do it. So read is defined down here. Um, <laughs> wait, uh, where are all the places we're using it? So I can redefine this over here. Wait, no. So instead of calling this a val, Ah, I can call this, no, I could, I could name my function a value, and it could be, given these, do the following, that's a valid property getter or setter and expected, so, Wait, oh, um, so this can be a function over here, and you don't name the variables over here now, you name them over here. memory mode p is this valid probably not cannot infer a type for this parameter well that's why they're declared on the left see i declared this is a value it doesn't change it's a value that refers to this function um, oh wait no this needs to return a type um, so it's a function that takes these types and returns that type and I guess for some reason I need to specify all this stuff I don't know. We're going back. I had a bad feeling about that. Val f no. Val z is equal to int map to int equals a, A plus one. Is this not valid? What's invalid about it? This type, mapping to this return type, is equal to this function definition. 
is this only valid within the context of a function? Like down here? I can't just declare functions and call them values. All right, can I curry functions? Um, also, why am I calling this a mutable list here? This doesn't need to be mutable. Um, this doesn't need to be mutable. So fun f. I'm just going to try something stupid here first. Fun ASDF is equal to um, read for these types. OK, I can do this, right? So I can reference a function in the same scope for another function. But if I take this function, this ASDF, and stick it up here, that's not valid. What would be valid is referencing another function also declared up here, um, like that. That's valid. So, um, read is of type list of int. Um, yeah, what are the types in read again? List of int, 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 and returns an int. So that works. This compiles at least. So I can define a thing for reading. Or honestly, that doesn't need to be a parameter to step or anything. It can be, but maybe I just make this, I don't know. But yeah, since I can use a method reference, um, I can then consume read the same way that I've consumed it elsewhere. Um, so. If this memory at p2 else p2 bearing in mind that that could all like be in immediate mode and whatever um, so no it's not else p2 it's else PC plus. Uh, now that takes, that's the other thing is this takes, uh, <sighs> I actually need the program counter to make this work too. Jeez. Else PC plus three. If that, then read p2, um, read p2, and this is mode over 10, mod 10. So that's consistent. 
it's ugly as hell, but um, mode over 10, mod 10, fine. Wait, oh, and then here we need the actual PC. Um, so this here, where I'm saying PC plus one, that's not correct either. This needs to be memory at address PC plus one. And this next thing needs to be memory at PC plus two. So I think that might work. There's a chance it'll work. So instructions five and six take two parameters. Seven, if the first parameter is less than the second, it stores one in the position given by the third parameter. So yeah, this is fun. Should we try it? <laughs> Creating this jump function didn't make anything any easier. I mean, it did isolate one thing, which I probably would have struggled a bit with, which is this. But um, overall, this hasn't become any easier. All right, let's run it. So first, have I introduced a regression? Um, good old test-driven development. All right, yep, we got a regression um, already. Read. All right, I step. So step requires memory, mode, PC, and read. I'm not providing most of those things. Read is probably undefined in this scope. <laughs> Function invocation read expected. Yep, 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 yep. So, let's see if I can hack this together somehow. R is equal to, for a list of int, and an int, and a p, um, read, wait, no, is equal to memory, uh, mode p, read memory mode p. Please let that, nope, I did something wrong. Memory being a list of int. Oh, I'm sorry. This needs to map to a return type. All right. And can I call this read, or would that be too confusing? could inline this as a parameter right there. Um, so I'm not sure what to do. I just declared a method reference here, which is great. Um, 
and very short-lived. So, how often are we using this read thing? I mean, this keeps pushing me toward trying to create a computer that actually does have a reader, but um, I don't, I don't know. This just doesn't feel like something that belongs here at all. We're coercing this uh, just so it compiles. All right, we got some warnings, or we got a warning. Val R, name shadowed, memory. Oh, okay. Point taken. Where is memory declared? Way up there. Yeah. You're right. Um, that's exciting. Why can't I just do like underscore and then read underscore? Why do these all have to have parameter names? Alright, so that I can execute my existing programs. That's nice. Here's a program. Mutable list of this stuff. And we require an ID. Take one input, compare it to the value 8, and then produce one output. So, I guess I can move this down here. I can run that, I guess. So if the input is 8, it outputs a 1. If the output is not an 8, it does not output a 1. I'm satisfied. All right. Um, this program, using position mode, uh, consider whether it's less than 8. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. All right, that's cool. That looks awfully loud. Oh, there we go. There's a seven. I was wondering how that was different. Um, all right, let's take this input. Consider whether it's equal to eight. And this here. Consider whether it's less than 8. <sighs> I should probably do way more testing than that. Beautiful thing about functional programming is that if it compiles, um, you can, I don't know, I feel confident in it if it compiles. I shouldn't. But at the end of the stream, it feels so comforting.
Um, so one, zero, one, zero. If it's equal to eight, equal to eight, less than eight, less than eight. This uses immediate mode rather than position mode. Here are some jump tests that take an input. Um, then I'll put uh, zero if the input was zero, or one if the input was non-zero. All right, we're going to test first. Um, I'm going to leave the eight in there. So I have some non-zero inputs. So yeah, they output a one because the uh, this input is non-zero. And if I stuff a zero in here, um, now what I should be doing is like setting up batteries of tests and ways to automate. Um, I don't know, nice regression tests and stuff. This uses an input instruction to ask for a single number. It will output 999 if the value is below 8, 1000 if it's equal to 8, or 1001 if it's greater than 8. Uh, -ba -doop. All right. That's cool. Um, this time, I'm going to test, etc., etc. Um, yeah, there's the 1000. Let's just put 8 as the parameter to everything here. This time, when the test diagnostic program runs its input instruction to get the ID of the system test, provided a 5 over the thermal radiator controller. Diagnostic test only outputs one number, the diagnostic code. What? Um, so it's saying this time provided a five instead of a one. All right. Um, so we'll just treat this as another set of tests. There we go. And let's run it and wait for it to explode. <laughs> this time, the diagnostic test suite only produces one number, the diagnostic code. And there it is. Come on. I know I was slow. I know I was bad. Um, But if you just, yeah, there we go. That's the right answer. You are one gold star closer to rescuing Santa. You've completed day five. You can share this victory. I ain't sharing this victory with nobody. It's my victory. Oh, I mean, I could share the fact that I had a victory. That'd be good. <laughs> yeah. I dumped all the diagnostic output for all the test stuff here. If I were to comment out this stuff, we would only get the one number. But yeah, you're right. That's multiple numbers, definitely. Uh, so, yeah, we got our leaderboards. We got our private leaderboard. Where is my super exclusive top secret private leaderboard? All right, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Oh, yeah, there's my top secret, super secret private leaderboard code. All right, hope you caught that. So folks at work are all excited about this stuff. Give them, getting questions nonstop about it, which is crazy. Um. But yeah, folks at Lee Chess are having some fun with this too. Uh, oh, I appear to be having more fun with this than everybody else on Lee Chess put together. No, 
just kidding but um i got a lot of points on our leaderboard so there is that all right so there's the calendar and the advent code and there's 15 minutes until the next problem's released uh how do you join um let me get you the code for this um yeah you just need the top secret super secret code that like uh do i still have the code somewhere i hope so if not i'll have to go get it let's see Boop -doop -doop. Yeah, I will need to go find the invite code that I was given so I can share it with you. <laughs> um, so I guess that's the plan. Um, you could join my super secret like thing that I I created that like I'm the only person on my own private leaderboard. And I find it very unlikely that folks are going to join my silly leaderboard. Um, especially when other folks on Lee Chess already have their leaderboards. So why would you join mine? Um, but somewhere here... Yeah, there's my super secret code. Um, not sure why any actually in my discord i dumped this code so anybody could see it there but um this isn't the lee chess code this is just my code but i want to give you like the lee chess one but my thing in case like nobody's going to be interested in this because you're just competing against me there's nobody else on here uh i think uh yeah yeah i think like below the stream uh, actually, do I have a command for this? Yeah! Check that out. <laughs> um, I think this is my code. 149 D8F81. Yeah, so I think this is my advent of code code. Um, uh, most of what's on my discord is just me sharing videos of fun silly things um there's really not much talking most of the chatter is generated by the bots there oh yeah yeah dark twinge is pretty great i like that he's got a programming channel like not many people have one of those Um, so, uh, not sure what else to do. I do want to wrap up the stream before this hits, because God, I am not doing another one of these right now. It would be fantastic for stream ratings and entertainment value and such, but, um, not happening right now. So, we're going to make sure to wrap it up in the next... 11 minutes and 55 seconds just to preclude the possibility that I might even think about attempting day six any time before dawn um but yeah uh there's also previous years of this stuff out here somewhere i don't know where i'll have to find it this is still using intellij idea um I'm getting better and better at figuring out how to lay this stuff out and make it entertaining. So, uh, in my mind, key was being able to view the problem here, being able to develop software and uh, view the output of live tests. And there's really just too much to show on one stream. You really need to like have a squad stream or something where one is just the guy working on a full screen display coding everything then then the other stream would be like the problem description and or the live output or you need some way of being able to juggle like two screens worth of information 
And I think the only way to effectively do that is by using two different streams. Uh, streams with an M. Wow. Anyway, um, thanks for hearing me rant for five hours. Um, uh, yeah, no, congrats on solving that. Um, oh, you offered to show me your C++ solution for this. Uh, yeah, I maybe my Discord's the best place to continue that conversation. That way other people can opt into it as well. Um, so, yeah, I am curious. I still need to find a way to get IntelliJ IDEA to export to, like, a private Git repo or something. Maybe even GitLab. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, thanks for joining. Um, I'll be doing a, more and more of these. Because uh, I find it more fun doing it right here than I do trying to answer everything at work. Uh, at work, they like immediate feedback to questions. And these do not encourage immediate feedback. It just encourages more questioning. So it's best to know the answers up front. So this is a much more laid back environment. It's challenging. Um, it's kind of infuriating learning how Kotlin script and Kotlin are different. But hey, we learned something. Uh, we learned function currying, where I was able to pass a method reference into, or a function reference into another function. So that was fantastic. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching, and see you around.